In today's video, we're going to introduce you to a directional coupler. We're not really going to talk about the theory of how they work, but more so, you know, uh, what their characteristics are, uh, how you might use them, and, uh, and how to interpret the specifications. The unit I have here is from Mini Circuits. It's a model ZFDC-20-5+. And uh, this is the device right here. So let's take a look at uh, really what a directional coupler is and look at some of the specifications and what they really mean you know, when we go and hook it up to a circuit, what does it actually do? A directional coupler is kind of an interesting RF device. Uh, really internally what it consists of is kind of a main transmission line path okay, called the main line and uh, it's intended to have very low loss, typically less than a dB uh, or so, but depending, it depends on frequency of course. And then there's also a coupled line Okay, now the idea is that when you have power traveling from the input to the output, a portion of that is coupled to the coupled line. But it's only for signals that are traveling in that direction. For signals traveling in the other direction, there's very little coupling into that coupled line. Now really, uh, directional couplers are kind of bi-directional devices, and oftentimes if you have a directional coupler that just has a single coupled output, it means that the other coupled output which is coupling from the other direction is internally terminated and that's kind of represented here in the schematic. So for this device we've got a main line path that goes in this direction and our coupled path that goes down that way. And then any return or reverse power coming this way will be coupled very little to the end. Now all directional couplers, whether they're made from coupled strip lines or uh, RF transformers, will always have a usable frequency range and that will usually be printed prominently on the device or certainly listed in the data sheet. This particular device is rated from 100 kilohertz out to 2 gigahertz. So it's a pretty nice broadband directional coupler. Okay, so one of the prominent specs is the main line loss. And this is how much power is lost from the input to the output. And here's some typical data for this device uh, over its operating frequency range. And we can see it's typically you know, a dB or less. It goes up a little bit closer to 2 dB at 2 gigahertz, but it's under a dB down at uh, lower frequencies. So all that means is that uh, we're going to have essentially very little loss in that forward direction uh, or anywhere along the main line from input to output. Uh, the next important spec is called the coupling spec. Now the coupling spec basically says for that coupled output how many dB down is it compared to the signal on the main line? And uh, we can see for this one that it's typically about 20 dB. It's typically actually just a little bit under 20 dB, but we can call this a 20 dB coupler. So what that means is that the signal coming out of this uh, port here will be 20 dB down from the main signal going here. In terms of voltage, that's a factor of 10x. So let's take a look at that on the scope. Okay, I've got an input signal here at 20 megahertz coming from the function generator uh, into the input port of the coupler and that is going out the output port and that's going into channel 1 of the scope and that's the yellow trace here. You might be able to read down here the RMS value about 225, about 225 millivolts. And the coupled port right here is going into channel 2 of the scope and I've purposely put uh, channel 1 and channel 2 on the same scale, 100 millivolts of division, so that we can just visually see that it's about a factor of 10 in amplitude. And you can kind of see it's almost exactly a factor of 10. It's, I'm looking at uh, 23.7 millivolts here. So just a little bit less than a factor of 10. And that kind of makes sense. Uh, we looked at this, the typical performance specs here. We're typically just under 20 dB uh, down at the lower frequency range. So that's what we mean by you know the coupled port uh, ratio or the coupled port spec that the signal coming out of the coupled port is about one tenth of the power in this case 20 dB down of the power in the main line in the forward direction from the in to the out. So the next spec to talk about is directivity. Now directivity is um, this is how many dB down the coupled port output will be compared to this value when the signal is going in the opposite direction. So, it, uh, so you really would almost want to add up these two values, the coupling and directivity, if you want to figure out what to expect out of the coupled port 
when you send power in the reverse direction. So we can see here I've got numbers 25, 33, 34, you know, in the 30, 35 dB range of directivity, so that for the reverse power we'd have that 30, 35 dB plus the 20, so we're going to be down about 55 dB in the reverse direction, so that's a, a lot of attenuation. So let's take a look at that on the scope. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just reverse the input and output. So I'll take my signal generator off here, take the, output, the signal going to channel 1 of the scope, and go to the input, and go to the output here. So now if we take a look, I'm still getting my full signal through the, the main line path. So the, the main line loss is basically the same in either direction, but now that coupled port is barely visible and it's only reading in the hundreds of microvolts now, probably just looking more at noise. But it's going to be you know 55 dB down or more uh, in that reverse direction. Okay, we've been looking at this uh, currently with both the main line properly terminated into 50 ohms as well as the coupled line properly terminated into 50 ohms at the scope inputs. And uh, of course with the main line path being properly terminated there's no reflected energy coming back. So there's en no energy coming back through the coupler in this direction. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing very little signal here. Now an interesting use for a directional coupler is to measure how much reflected energy we've got coming back from a load. That might be for tuning an antenna or a diplexer or something like that. So um, let's take a look at what happens if I misterminate that load. So if I set the scope channel termination instead of being in 50 ohms, I set it to 1 mega ohms. What that means is that effectively all of the energy that is being that is coming to this uh, end of the coax here is being reflected back down the line back towards the generator. So that means that I've got signal now flowing through the input of this coupler through the output port back to the generator. And that's essentially the forward direction for the coupler. So now I'm going to see a signal that's 20 dB down from that reflected signal coming out the coupled port. And there I am there back again with the 24 millivolt or so uh, reflected signal coming back. So this gives us a way of essentially looking at reflected energy coming back from a misterminated line. We're properly terminated, there's nothing coming back, and we're misterminated, and we've got a reflected signal coming back. All right, so what we can see here is that uh, the coupler can be used in either direction. When used to tap off essentially a signal in the forward path, uh, you could essentially get a sample of a signal that's being sent out to a load or an antenna or something else, maybe a power amplifier. And that coupled port could be used to maybe go into a frequency counter or a spectrum analyzer to monitor the signal or maybe into some more sophisticated uh, automatic power control loop or something like that. Uh, when used to, in essentially the reverse direction, if you will, measuring power coming back from a load, uh, that can be then useful, like I showed here, to monitor you know, how much energy is being reflected from a load in some kind of an RF system. It could be an antenna or something like that. So let's actually go take a look at uh, a practical way that we could use a coupler like this, along with a spectrum analyzer and tracking generator, to essentially sweep the, you know, a range of frequencies into an antenna system and measure where that's resonant and essentially what the match is. Okay, so we've got the directional coupler hooked up into the spectrum analyzer uh, with the tracking generator. And it's generally pretty good practice to put an inline attenuator, like a 10 dB pad, at the output of the tracking generator. And the reason for that is if you're feeding into an antenna out of the, uh, out of the coupler who's, uh, that's not resonant over a wide frequency range, uh, you don't want that uh, varied impedance to be a direct load on the, uh, the tracking generator. So by putting a 10 dB pad in there, it keeps the impedance that the, you know, the load that the tracking generator is seeing relatively constant, even if the, uh, the signal at the output of the attenuator varies a bit over frequency with the antenna. So we're coming out of the padded uh, tracking generator into the output port of the coupler. Uh, and the reason we're going in the output uh, and putting the antenna at the input is because we want the coupled signal coming out of the coupler to be representative of the power reflected back from the antenna. Okay, uh, we've got the analyzer set up to be center frequency at 20 megahertz, a span at 10 megahertz. 
The antenna that I have hooked up here is tuned roughly to the uh, 18 megahertz uh, band, 17 meter amateur radio band. Uh, might be a little bit off of where I had originally tuned it because it's here in the basement and not outside <laughs> on a, in a proper mounting position. Okay, so we'll turn on the tracking generator. And in doing so, I can see right away that I have a bit of a dip here. And what that dipper is representing is essentially return loss. Uh, return loss is a measure of how well matched the load is to the transmission line. And the lower the value, okay, more dB down is better. It means that you've got less and less energy reflecting back. So what this is showing me is down at the 10 megahertz end and up here at the 30 megahertz end, we've got a lot of energy being reflected back. In fact, almost all of it. And then there's a particular frequency where the antenna is resonant, where the, the antenna is absorbing and radiating all of the power. And that, that's the point that we want to measure. That's the resonant location or resonant frequency of this antenna. But before we get a real accurate measurement, uh, what I want to do is normalize the trace. So what we'll do is we'll uh, set up the coupler so that all of the energy is being reflected back. So I can use that as a reference. So I'll simply disconnect the antenna and now I can see I get a flat line because that over this entire frequency range all of the energy is being reflected back and we're just essentially seeing you know our the maximum coupled output so we'll use that as a reference of course now every analyzer is going to be different in how you set this up uh, in this case we go to trace math and go to normalize and I'll do an instant normalize and what that will do is measure uh, that, that value and give me a display line you might be able to see in red and then the measurements will all be with respect to that so now I've got uh, things normalized I can go and hook my load back okay, up. I can now go hook up uh, the coax that's going off to the antenna and uh, there we go so now my measurements will be a bit more calibrated and I can just uh, throw a marker on here and if I move that marker around if I move it right down to that minimum point Okay, we can see that right about there, and that's right at about 18.09, 18.1 megahertz or so. We're down about uh, minus 15, minus 15.8, minus 15.7 dB from our normalized value up here. So that tells me that the return loss at resonance is about minus 15.7 dB or so. Okay, of course, knowing the return loss, minus or about uh, 15.7 dB or so, we can calculate SWR, or we could just use a nice chart. There's a really nice chart I picked up online, many circuits. And if we uh, scroll down here and look for that uh, oh, 15.6, 15.7 number, we can see that refers to a VSWR of about minus, excuse me, 1.4 to 1, 1.39, 1.4 to 1. And that's a pretty darn good match. Uh, anything below about 2 to 1 is generally acceptable and, and for all intents and purposes anything below about 1.5 to 1 you can consider you know pretty darn near perfect. So, um, so that tells us that at that 18.1 megahertz frequency we should have an SWR of about, my, about 1.4 to 1. So let's go verify that real quick. There's one other tool we can use to verify the SWR versus frequency is an antenna analyzer like this MFJ259. I've got the antenna hooked up to the test port up here and we can basically just adjust frequency watching SWR looking for that dip and once we find that dip we can fine tune it by watching the meter up top here and I can see that uh, it's probably right about here and I'm right about that 18.09 uh, megahertz that we saw in the spectrum analyzer SWR of 1.4 and that agrees to what we measured using the return loss method with the directional coupler on the spectrum analyzer and tracking generator. So both of them could be used to make this measurement, but the, using the tracking generator on the spectrum analyzer gives you a nice visual picture of what the return loss is versus frequency. And that might be handy when uh, looking at the resonant properties of a multiband antenna, or if you're trying to tune like a, uh, um, a resonant cavity for like a duplexer in a repeater system or something like that. So yeah, I hope you learned a little something about uh, directional couplers and what they do, what the specs mean, and a couple of ways they could be used in RF systems. Thanks again for watching. Comments are always welcome. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks again for watching.